So I'm Rebecca Gore. I live in Chelmsford, and I have a, a, a child, so I'm very interested in the state of the planet, and hopefully that will get on board and do something about the obvious issue with climate change. So, Bern, you want to take it up next? Sure. Yeah, my name is Bern Kuzicki. Um, I'm a Chelmsford, too. I'm uh, Jim Arciero is my, my uh, rep. And uh, we, I got involved with a couple of others on this, this chat um, to help found Chelmsford Trump, Climate Action Team. Um, Tom, you want to go next? Yeah, I'm Tom Amaro from Chelmsford, also associated with ECA and Chelmsford Climate Action Team. And um, I, I've been you know, interested in the bills in the legislature for about a year now. And of course, I'm concerned that uh, we haven't passed um, anything significant yet. And so we'll be talking more today about that. Dale, you want to go next? Sure. I'm Dale Luke. I'm actually a Florida resident, but I'm a snowbird. And I've been a long-term Chelmsford resident. Most of my kids went to school here in Chelmsford. Uh, well, all of them did to some extent. Only the last one graduated in Florida. I'm a chemist, retired from NASA. Um, I've had an interest in climate change for a long time. My first job was uh, designing mercury analyzers uh, way back in the 70s. And I basically do a lot of instrumentation stuff and that kind of thing. It's, uh, I've had a strong interest in the climate discussion since, oh, probably about 2006, when they started having some discussions amongst uh, my group at, uh, at NASA. Um, since then, I have been following fairly closely on Scientific American and whatever publications I can come across. Okay, okay. Um, Melissa, you want to go next? Hey, everyone. My name is Melissa Joyce. I'm the Sustainability Manager for the Town of Chelmsford. I do not live in Chelmsford, but I'm here to support all you lovely people. And Tammy, I went to Mount Holyoke, too. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Julianne, you want to... Um, Sure. Hi. Um, I live in Chelmsford. I've been uh, uh, living here for 35 years. I've had a lifelong interest in environmental issues, but it's only recently since I've retired that I feel like I have the time and energy to kind of get involved. So I'm a little bit recent um, to the group, but um, I am concerned about uh, the, what the legislature is going to be able to get done um, in the next month or so particularly with the other crises that are that you know the state is trying to handle barbara well i'm barbara terrio i live in westford and am one of the people that's helped to start a really fledgling new organization here a little committee westford climate action I've been involved and interested in environmental issues for 50 years, starting with the first Earth Day. And uh, I'm very concerned that very little's been done since the first Earth Day. But uh, I also uh, want to see some progress in the State House and do what I can to help that along. And Melissa and Tammy, I'm also a Mount Holyoke graduate. <laughs> Oh, we're being outnumbered. Okay, wow. Kathy. I love you? it. That's awesome. Um, okay, we're just doing introductions. I'm sorry, I'm a little bit late here. Um, Kathy Cryan Hicks, and I'm from Chelmsford. I worked at the Chelmsford Public Library for 30 years and retired and uh, got involved in Elders Climate Action. And um, soon, within uh, several months, we got started with the Chelmsford group, uh, Tom and Bern and I. Um, <laughs> kind of co-founders of our newly <laughs> named uh, Chelmsford Climate Action Team. And, uh, <laughs> is there something else I'm supposed to answer here? <laughs> no, I think that will do it. We're just trying to keep this okay. brief. And who's um, joined on the phone? We just see a phone number. That's me. Who's me? Tammy. Oh, Tammy. Oh, Tammy. Okay. Got yeah. you. Oh, I just saw that uh, Margaret just joined with her phone and video because it, it gives better audio quality. Sorry about that. Okay. Um, and I'm going to do a brief introduction for our um, town hall 
star. And um, so, and then we'll get into some of the more nitty gritty stuff of the town hall. Um, I want to say I first met Tammy Govea back in the early 2000s. It's been that long, Tammy. <laughs> When we were both working at UMass Lowell, she was a bright, energetic, enthusiastic, and passionate program associate at the Lowell Center for Sustainable Production. Almost 20 years later, she is still a bright, extremely energetic, enthusiastic, and passionate, and now the state representative for the 14th Middlesex District. For those of us in Chelmsford, for whom there is a myriad of state representatives, it can be confusing. If you live in precincts one and nine, you are able to vote for Tammy, but it is safe to say that she represents the interests of all of Chelmsford. And um, uh, uh, Tammy has degrees in both social work and public health, and clearly has a Mount Holyoke um, fan base here and um, is finishing her PhD in public health at BU. And when I said energetic, I meant energetic. In her first year in office, she filed almost 20 pieces of legislation and is on record favoring the three pieces of climate legislation we have asked her here today to discuss. Please welcome State Representative Tammy Govea. Oh, Rebecca, <laughs> that's such a nice, <laughs> nice introduction. It's, I'm only 45 years old, so it's pretty amazing to have this longevity of uh, friendships and relationships that carry forward into different aspects of, uh, in different paths of, parts of my career path. So uh, always a pleasure to be with you and to have your support and see so many people um, who I've met before and know. Um, really happy to be here. Um, I am getting some work done on my house. This is the downside of uh, Zoom, so uh, there might be moments when I have to mute myself. If it, it's too loud in the background, just uh, let me know, and I'm more than happy to accommodate whatever we need uh, to accommodate here. Um, you know, it, it's interesting. I was on the, um, because I represent parts of Chelmsford, but then also, which is in the Merrimack Valley, and then I represent Concord, Carlisle, and Ashton, which are considered more in Metro West. I mean, part of the planning commission that covers that is the MAPC, the Metropolitan Area and Planning Commission. And um, they had a, a legislative breakfast this morning. And the big focus, of course, was on climate legislation and transportation legislation because they've really been pushing a lot on uh, those avenues for a number of years. And um, I think there's mixed uh, experiences of state reps and state senators because um, some of my colleagues were on that call and they were saying that they don't hear from their constituents at all. So Mike Barrett was the one who said that he's not hearing from constituents on climate. And I said, wait a second, I'm hearing from climate from constituents on climate pretty much every single day. I had a call with a, a constituent yesterday to figure out some advocacy steps because they're really interested in the net zero stretch energy code and wanting to know what are the best avenues to advocate for that particular uh, component of addressing our climate crisis. Um, we did the town hall this morning. We have this one here. So I am hearing from constituents. What I'm also hearing is that the speaker has said on two occasions, two different occasions since COVID and since the racial justice protests, that he does want to get climate policy passed this year. So I, I think just continue the advocacy, uh, making sure that you're, you're articulating what your specific priorities are and the bills that you've laid out here. Um, we are hearing that um, there is some internal leadership support for Rep Moschino's bill, which is the roadmap bill. Um, I think that if that were to pass in the House, there would be some uh, negotiating with the Senate on the behind the scenes, probably in conference committee or the like, to figure out what are um, the pieces in the Senate bill that are not addressed if we were to pass uh, Rep. Moschino's uh, roadmap bill. Um, it does not seem like we're going to get 100% renewable or carbon pricing, uh, perhaps in the ways that we all would want them to be or conceive of them in this group. And I know that's the case for a lot of climate activists across the Commonwealth, just, um, you know, feeling a pit in your stomach that these things, you know, may not be part of a climate package that we get passed. Um, but the roadmap bill will help with some of this stuff over the over the term or some version of uh, the roadmap. So 
I, I don't want folks to feel like everything is doom and gloom because we are so focused on COVID and racial justice protests. Um, there is still interest in the legislature and in the House leadership to, to get something done um, and to get something done this session. I hope that's helpful. Um, let's see, by the way, um, the, the agenda is um, in the chats if someone wants to keep track of it. Um, one thing, um, one thing that uh, we, um, I, 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 I guess a number of us are sort of beginners in dealing with the um, state legislature and we're not really sure about um, how things are getting done under the virus restrictions. And, um, hmm. and you know, um, we've, we've seen articles in the paper that say that uh, voting is hard to do and bills are moving slowly. And uh, so the, the concern is that, um, that uh, we'll run out of time. And we know that the budget is a mess and the budget mm -hmm. gets probably first priority. Um, you know, is the budget gonna take up the rest of the session and then we're gonna be out of time or, or what? And uh, you mentioned there was a priority for legislation. We know that both Baker and um, DeLeo spoke out in January in favor of uh, Massachusetts having uh, net zero carbon by 2050, but that was before the virus struck. And now um, uh, we on the outside have the perception that things are up in the air and uh, mm -hmm. we don't know what's happening. So, um, and, and finally, um, we hear about bills being compromised or merged together, the Senate and the House bill. If, it, if the House bill, does the House bill have to pass first before they can be merged? And if, and if that happens, you know, what is the procedure for getting that merger to happen? And is that a, a long process or a short process? So that, those are some of the questions yeah. that, that we have. Those are all uh, super important, uh, really good questions. So to answer the first one of how we're uh, voting uh, in session in the midst of COVID-19. So for, let me just back up for a second before I explain how we're voting. Um, there are two different sort of sessions um, in which we vote. There's formal session and informal session. And it's confusing because session also means like we're in the 191st legislative session, right? So there's sort of the big overarching session and then there's session days. So they, we have, when we're in informal session, um, we don't have to have a quorum present. Uh, it's usually an informal session where the non-controversial bills are taken up. So early in COVID, there were some bills that were getting passed. They were getting passed in informal session, meaning we, because we didn't have a mechanism for doing remote voting, and we were also observing physical distancing guidelines and not coming into the state house to actually do our voting. It took a, I can't recall exactly, around six to eight weeks before we actually started to um, do remote voting on the House side. The Senate just started remote voting on Tuesday. Um, so the Senate has lagged a little bit in how they've been thinking about uh, how to approach um, voting. So the reason why getting voting remotely up and running is important is that we have to, when it comes to money bills, like the budget, supplemental budget, those kinds of things, we have to be in chamber. We have to have that vote taken by a roll call. So when we're in informal session, it's just a voice vote. You could have five people in the chamber and those bills will pass. If one person objects though, then it is held that there's no action taken on that bill and it gets taken up the very next day. Um, and we saw this happen with um, the housing bill, the, the rent moratorium bill. Um, the, there was a Republican, I think a Republicans blocked it two days in a row and then it finally passed on the third day without, um, or maybe that was our rules. Actually it was our rules that that happened to um, because we had to implement emergency rules to do remote voting. So that's how informal session works. The, the climate package will be controversial enough. There'll be amendments that will be filed. Um, 
and because of so many vested interests, right? Um, you you got your gas station owners and your oil small mom and pop oil companies, and then you have you know those of us who are more on the uh, you know wanting bold climate change. We may want to pass. Uh, or uh, submit amendments to strengthen the bill. So this will be something that will need to be taken up in formal session. The way formal session is working remotely is um, we have four divisions in the house and each division is divided in half. So we essentially have eight subdivisions right now as we're in this remote voting process. And I call into, everybody calls into a line that is for their subdivision, a conference line. Um, we can hear a session through our conference line. Um, if we want to speak, we have to get off that call and call into a different line um, and then have the opportunity to speak and be heard. It's a little complicated for those like me. I only have one phone line. <laughs> so it was a little bit, I, I spoke out on an amendment I filed around elections laws, um, the election bill that we voted on last two weeks, almost two weeks ago. Um, but because uh, I haven't had a landline in, I don't know, almost 20 years, I guess. Um, so uh, it, it's, it's a little complicated. It's a little clunky. Uh, but it does allow us to file amendments, speak on amendments, roll call amendments, have the final vote taken also be roll called. And that's important because then you get to see how your state rep voted on a particular amendment or the bill overall. Um, and that go, ties in with the transparency question that's, you know, that a number of us have been really focused on for since we got sworn in. Um, I don't recall your second question. So if you could restate that, that would be great. And hopefully I answered enough on how we're voting in this formal and informal thing enough. What was your second agenda item or question? Um, let's see. I'm not sure that... Um... Um, it was a, I think it was about bills being compromised or merged. Oh yeah, bills being merged. How's, what's the process for that? So, yeah, okay. So we passed already in the House, and this ties to your third question. So we already passed in the House the Greenworks bill. That's the House version of a climate bill for this session. The Senate on their side passed uh, the three-part legislation, um, their Senate package on climate change. So what will need to happen in order for there to be like the compromise, it's called conference committee, is um, we would have to pass a version of the Senate's bill and the Senate would need to pass a version of the House bill and then those would go into conference committee. And it, it gets a little complicated. It's kind of like the making of sausage. There would be one bill that is bill number that would be selected as like the vehicle is what we call it, the vehicle for moving a bill forward. So all of those bills that get, the bills that got passed on the Senate side and the House side, and maybe if we take up the roadmap, it'll all get packaged, I would assume, into, um, this is the way it could go. It could all get packaged into one specific bill, and it might just pick the Greenworks number as, as the vehicle. And you'll know that once there's like an opportunity to like weigh in and get phone calls in and, uh, you know, have reps file amendments on that. Um, so we don't, we, we already did pass something in the House, as I said, and the Senate already passed on their side. So now we just have to basically vote on each other's bills is, is what I'm hearing is the strategy. And I'm trying to simplify what the process kind of looks like. Um, there are other steps that could happen along the way. Um, and uh, there could be something that gets passed in the budget, for example. Um, and, and uh, you know, some climate legislation. It might not be as big and bold and as robust as we're looking for here uh, because typically we don't take up really major pieces of legislation in the budget. It's called an outside section. So we wouldn't normally, um, normally outside sections are for uh, a little bit, um, I don't want to say less controversial, but just uh, pieces of, of legislation or aspects of bills that, um, are, are, are not as uh, large and, and uh, sort of over-encompassing uh, like we would want with uh, climate legislation. Um, so hopefully that, that is clear and that makes sense uh, in the ways that I'm describing it. Um, the other part of your question was worried about us when we take it up. There's a very high likelihood that 
we can suspend the rules so that we can go past July 31st. So I'm not overly concerned like, oh, no, if we don't get it done by July 31st, we're done. What I'm hearing and, and the signals I'm getting is that we will be in session probably through early fall. I could be wrong about all of this, so keep the pressure on <laughs> um, because both the House and the Senate, I believe, would need to concur on extending past the July 31st date. There are people who are running for office who have uh, who are uh, running competitive races or who have opponents. Those are the folks that are a little bit less uh, – excited to stay in formal session because they want to be out campaigning, whatever that looks like virtually. I don't, I don't really know. Um, Cause I don't have, I don't have a competitive race. I don't have an opponent. Um, but that's usually the calculation of, and in part why we by design end July 31st is so that people can go out and do their campaigning. Um, the counter argument that a lot of us give is, the way that you show your constituents that you're doing a good job and you deserve to quote unquote be rehired is to just do the job. <laughs> it's to be in session, pass bills. Um, and, and there was something that you said that there's a perception that bills are moving more slowly during COVID. I don't know that I would agree with that only because I find that bills and legislation moves at a snail's pace already. And I don't think it's slowed down that dramatically. I think the criticism I would have of the legislature is that we haven't necessarily, we have um, sort of defaulted to the governor making the hard decisions and passing a lot of executive orders. And there were things that the legislature could have taken up that we chose not to. And we've sort of, I think, just left the governor to make some of those, those choices. Um, I'll say one other thing um, that might be useful to you and, and just help you understand some of the context. Um, so we have, we, on the House side, we passed the transportation package just before COVID-19 um, really hit. And um, we, for, for us on the House side, um, we passed both the bond bill aspect as well as um, the, the revenue legislation, which includes the gas tax, which there were mixed opinions on a gas tax. I have mixed opinions because I care a lot about economic equity and social justice. Um, so I do have concerns, I'll be honest, about a gas tax. It's not that I'm concerned to take a tax vote like that. I think there's, for climate purposes, it, it is important to have a gas tax. But we took that tax vote on the House side. The Senate has not done that. They have not taken up the whole transportation package. And so when we're thinking about some of the costs that might be associated with some of the climate pieces of legislation, I think that's going to be part of the calculation. Um, the speaker and the um, chair of Ways and Means, um, the chair came to our progressive caucus meeting the other day, and he said, you know, we took a, we took a tax vote in an election year on the House side, and the Senate hasn't done the same thing. So they're very reticent to take up any other have any other conversations around progressive revenue or progressive taxation. So um, just want you to kind of understand that because that could have implications for some of what the discussion looks like, particularly as it also relates to um, the budget. So I hope I covered all three of your, your questions, but more than happy to answer and clarify if anything is still confusing. One thing, um, one thing you said uh, kind of struck me, you said, uh, keep the pressure on. I guess one thing that um, we would like to know is what are the, what's the most effective way to keep the pressure on? What should we all be doing here? So um, for those of you who are in Westford, certainly, or other towns, certainly reach out to Rep and you live in Chelmsford, reach out to him, make sure that he knows, um, you know, Rep Golden is co-chair of the telecommunications utility and uh, Energy Committee with Mike Barrett, with Senator Barrett, I think it would be important to uh, make sure that Senator Barrett is hearing from you because it seems like he's feeling like he's not hearing from constituents um, and he's the co-chair. And I think it would be really helpful for him to hear from all of you that you are very active, that you really care about this, that yes, you care about the impacts and implications of COVID and the racial justice protests, but like we got to also deal with climate crisis and the climate crisis does have disproportionate effects on our communities of color and our low income communities. I would also encourage you to reach out to Chair Mikulitz, 
Um, on the House side, um, he's chair of Ways and Means and Rodericks, um, which looks like Rod Rodriguez, but it's Rodericks because he's Portuguese. Um, he's the Senate chair of Ways and Means. Those are the folks that you ought to be reaching out to um, to let them know what, what your priorities are and why you care about the issues that you care about. And make it personalized. Um, you, you don't have to send in a snail mail, but, you know, send in an email um, and CC your rep. So if I'm your rep, CC me so that I know that you've done that outreach. And if Jim Arcero uh, or Tom Golden is your rep, uh, you can also CC them as well. That's going to be helpful. I mean, we didn't know whether uh, email was as effective as snail mail or, or it, you know. Yeah, it is because I'll be honest, I haven't gotten my mail and since March 9th, not March 10th. Um, there's no mechanism for me to go get my mail. Um, so that's so it's, it's a challenge. Um, the other thing I would say is consider writing an op ed in the Lowell Sun or a letter to the editor. Um, you know, hopefully Tom Golden and uh, Arcero are reading those um, letters as well. Oh, and I'll say one other thing. Feel free to send in um, to, to like the folks I mentioned, Mikowitz and Roderick, feel free to send it in as a group like, you know, from the uh, Westford Climate Action Team and the Chumsford Climate Action Team. Send it as a group and everybody sign it, get electronic signatures going if you can, but also definitely send in your own individual letters because I think what they need is like a trickle, of, and this is what I've been saying to constituents who've asked me. I think it's helpful for them to have a trickle of letters coming in so that they know that this is still really important. And of course, CC the Speaker of the House and the Senate President as well on, on all of those. So you mentioned that um, you thought that the carbon pricing bill H2810 was not going to be, uh, didn't have a chance this year. So is there any, um, is there any um, reason to, to keep on pushing that bill, even though uh, you may have heard that it doesn't have a chance? Um. I feel like that's a, like a little above my pay grade in a way. <laughs> like, I don't know. Um, I think that's a question for Senator Barrett since he filed one of the versions of um, carbon pricing and get a sense from him what the best behind the scenes conversations are about that. Um, I mean, I don't think it's detrimental to talk about it. Um, I don't think it'll backfire or anything, but um, I think in part, you know, the, um, you know, the, the governor's conversations with the other uh, New England states on this and uh, coming up with like a regional approach, I think is partly interfering with um, some of the thinking around carbon pricing. Um, but I think Senator Barrett has a much better, better handle on that um, and could advise you uh, more appropriately than I can. Yeah, there is. Um... Carbon pricing is mentioned in both the roadmap bill and Senator Barrett's bills, uh, the 25, S2500, I think. It was our impression that those two bills are very similar, but the, I guess, Barrett's bill has probably got more stuff in it. Um, mm -hmm. And so we thought that yeah. those are the ones that would probably be merged together, um, not so much the Greenworks bill. And uh, is there a chance that carbon pricing could be um, merged into it in a more inclusive way than it is right now. I guess that's, that's the kind of thing, uh, question we're having. Yeah, I, I really don't, I really don't know. I mean, my saying that um, I don't, I don't know that carbon pricing is going to happen this year is because it just does not seem to be any of the things that are coming up on the house side. Um, Jen Benson's bill or Mike Barrett's bill. So if it's wrapped up in um, S2500, there, there's going to be some negotiating because I don't think that, um, and again, this is one of those things that would be seen as a tax, right? And we already took a tax vote on the House side. 
this is how people see it um, and, and, and feel it and, and where the pushback comes from. So it's, it's, it's fascinating, I'll be honest, to see how um, emotionally frustrated leadership in the House is um, around the fact that we took a tax vote and the Senate hasn't done anything with it. And I think the signal around that is, well, they didn't take a hard vote and we already did. We're not going to take another one. So I, it's sort of a weird, I don't know if you're aware of this, but the House and the Senate tend to have these <laughs> back and forth, right? Just kind of like what happens at the national level. It's just that we're all, we're all still in the same party. Like the we we hold the supermajority in both the House and the Senate, and we still can't seem to fully, um, you know, come to agreement as as easily as you might think, given that we're both, you know, of the same party. Um, so that's why I think talking to Senator Barrett about what he's hearing, and because he would be at the negotiating table around that as the chair of TUE and. His office is really the one, I think, his office and Ways and Means on the Senate side really did a lot of the work on the Senate package of bills. And we should say that um, the Westford and Chelmsford groups are, are combining to have a meeting like this with um, Representative Arciero in about a week and a half. Great. So Great. Uh, I think he's going to include um, um, Joan Machino too in that in that session. Oh, good. So that's great. Yeah, that's great. So I guess uh, so. I, I guess our action item is to follow up with Senator Barrett. Folks and, and, Definitely. Uh, yeah. We have a sister group in, in Lowell that's met with um, Tom Golden, and great. so we know we know what uh, what he thinks about. Uh, at least from those from those meetings. Um, what did he say? Can you share? Um, he said uh, that um, first of all, the carbon pricing he views as a gas tax, like like you said. Even though uh, we argue that it's really it's it's not gas tax because it's not a it's not a tax levied at point of the point of sale. And um, at least in the Benson bill, the tax isn't even used by the um, by the state. It goes back a large part of it goes back to the, the the people who actually paid it. So how's that a tax? Um, uh, when I've asked people um, privately, you know, would you uh, support a gas tax for climate change? Usually people say no. But if I ask them this, the question this way, um, you, you all know that, um, that when you burn gas, it causes damages to the atmosphere. Um, would you support paying for those damages the same time you buy gas tax? Would you, the same time you buy gas? Um, people almost always say yes. So it depends on how you ask the question. And right now the question is being framed as though carbon pricing is a tax, and and that's wrong. I, I don't know what to do about it. Well, I think there are a lot of industry and invested interests that are framing it that way, and so then um, people hear it that way, and it will get messaged that way, right? So I think that's why you're hearing it back from Chair Golden in the ways that you are hearing it, and it's the way I hear about it sometimes and the pushback around it, and. Um, yeah, and, and I think that we, whoever the we is in this, we were talking about it as a carbon tax in the beginning. We got savvy enough to switch and call it a carbon pricing in part because of the different ways to write the legislation and, and to, to approach it. Um, I think that, you know, Senator Barrett, when you talk to him, I, I think he prefers his version um, of, of carbon pricing over the, what had been the Benson bill um, my, uh, my pushback with him is I don't think that we should, um, have an added fee to, to cover the damages that we cause to the environment by, by spewing carbon into the air, have that fee go to educational programming. I said it should go for like purposes. And so 
there is anything that comes out of it, I would like to see it go to buildings, um, making them net zero, triple net zero in um, through the MSBA, the um, what uh, the the building um, the building fund uh, for schools, um, so that we're still supporting education. Um, we know that our building uh, fund is woefully um, under under resourced and will likely continue so because of the economic impacts of COVID. Um, depending on what happens with with the feds and if if the feds give us anything that really helps us, you know, address the six to nine billion dollar shortfall that we're expecting. Um, so that's my only criticism of the approach that Senator Barrett has taken, and I've explained that to him because we know that buildings are a huge component of uh, spewing carbon into the air as well, and it actually will help save our municipalities money over the long term. And the ones that can benefit from it right now are the Lexingtons and Concords and Actons of the of the state and not the, the Lowells and the Lawrences. And we need to be looking out for the Lowells and Lawrences as well. Yeah, I guess uh, one thing that um, would be helpful is to have a carbon, t uh, a, a carbon pricing bill um, support infrastructure that would make it less necessary to have a carbon pricing bill in the future. You know, that would be a kind of a direct feedback as opposed to sending it someplace else where it doesn't have a direct um, influence on, um, on the climate change. But I guess um, one other thing you asked about, um, yeah. about Chelmsford and what, what the comments are. Um, are um, I, I, I'm a recent uh, uh, resident in Chelmsford. I used to live in Acton. In fact, I would, would have been in your district right now if I still were there. Um, I, we've been told that uh, Chelmsford is very conservative. And so it's different, I think, than Acton, Concord, Lexington. And so this is sort of like a test case for climate, climate action, especially since we have four, four, four legislators here. And, um, and Senator Barrett. So um, um, we're, we're hoping that uh, we can do the right things to make um, climate be more accessible to everyone, not just people who are on the progressive side. Yeah, absolutely. So I guess we've, uh, we've handled uh, the carbon pricing issue. Um, um, the other two bills we had on here were one for environmental justice, which um, at least speaking for myself, I wasn't so aware of this up until recently. It hasn't been something that's been publicized in the general press until, until more recently, but it, it, it is very um, connected to um, all of uh, climate change. I mean, the people that are gonna get hurt most from climate change are the ones that don't have very much money. Um, and then the other one is uh, the roadmap bill, which I think we've touched on that, but, um, um, and you've answered questions as to how that might be justified or, or combined with the Barrett's bill. And I, I guess we weren't so um, uh, aware that, that the Greenworks bill could get mixed into that too. Now that's that's sort of new to us, or at least to me. Anyone else have any comments? Yeah. About yeah. Well, and what, and I, I'd be really curious to see what the conversation with uh, Reps Arcero and Moschino look like um, when you talk about the roadmap bill, because the, I think that she perhaps sees it one way, and Senator Barrett sees it a different way. Um, and I know that there's you know disagreements. Um, you know, with some of the climate activists and some of the climate groups around, does the Moschino, does the, does the um, Senate version do enough of what the Moschino bill really laid out and the timing of things? Um, I think, you know, even on the net zero stretch energy code legislation that I had written that then got wrapped up into uh, the Senate bill, uh, it extends the days out, I'm sorry, the years out a little bit further than what I had and it also moves it under uh, DOER, I'm not so sure that it really belongs there since it is the building code. Um, so I think that there are just going to be elements and components that there'll be a lot of sort of, uh, I think, negotiating around. And 
Um, this is why I say keep the pressure on and we'll keep the pressure on in the legislature because when we when we kept the pressure on in the legislature and the and particularly in the progressive caucus around education, we got an education bill that we were actually quite happy with, I'll be honest. Um, it had the elements that we really wanted in there. I think what's a little bit harder is that there are differences of opinion around what is the highest leverage um, aspect when it comes to climate. Sorry about my cat. This is teeter tot. Um, and um, uh, so I, I think it's so I'd be curious to see how how Rep Moschino sees it. Um, and in, in terms of what the crosswalk and the overlay might look like between her bill and um, that has a lot of climate activist support and then the Senate version. Um, so I hope that's that's helpful additional commentary for when you enter into that conversation with her. We, we do uh, plan to get back to, uh, we will finally get back with uh, Barrett. Um, we had him give a town, town hall here in February just before things got shut down. So, um, and he did say that um, he, um, was willing to negotiate about his bill, but he wanted to have more in it than the roadmap bill had in it. So that was- uh, Yeah, that, that's that makes sense, yeah. And then uh, your question on uh, EJ, environmental justice. So I started off my career in public health uh, through the environmental justice route. That was my first entry into it. When I was at Mount Holyoke, <laughs> uh, I did an independent study for a year and I looked at lead poisoning in the city of Lowell and looked at census tracts and really examined, you know, who was burdened by uh, dilapidated housing and um, language barriers, et cetera, et cetera. So I have long been a strong supporter and advocate of any things that we can do around environmental justice. And exactly to your point, Bert, you know, the communities that are the most impacted by environmental injustices and climate change are going to be low income and our black and brown communities specifically. And some of the data shows that, you know, black and brown communities and low income communities have actually been on board with bold climate change well before, um, you know, white suburban communities. We've been a little bit slower on the uptake um, because we don't experience the burdens in, the data, in our day-to-day -day lives. We're not, you know, experiencing the burden of a landfill across the street um, from where we grew up, like my legislative aide did, or, um, you know, dilapidated housing where you're exposed, your kids are exposed to lead and those kinds of things. So I think, uh, you know, the intersection with environment and justice is a really, is a really strong one, and I'm excited that there's been some efforts around it. I know that Rep Dubois, who's um, down on the South Shore, she is so passionate about environmental justice in this legislation that she files, and she talks about it all the time. So just know that there is a real major champion uh, in the House around this, and she does have, uh, you know, the support of allies like me and other colleagues who are also taking a serious um, commitment to environmental justice. And we see that the EJ bill is in ways and means also, I think. Does that mean that it's, it's uh, on, in, the, in the batter's box for getting sent out and acted on? It could be. I mean, it certainly makes it easier for a rep to file an amendment um, also, because oftentimes what will happen is if you file an amendment on a bill uh, that you also filed um, and it had a hearing, um, and, and, and then but sent to study, then the counter argument oftentimes will be, well, we sent it to study, it wasn't good enough kind of thing. Um, but the fact that this has made some progress is a positive sign. Um, and I, I'm hoping that our, you know, more recent, more serious conversations around um, racism and racial equity are going to uh, put that particular piece of legislation in a different light than if we hadn't been having the conversations around police brutality and um, working towards a more just society. So I, I think this gives us some, some um, I think people are paying attention in a, in a way that is very different than um, if we hadn't had George Floyd uh, get murdered by a police and then um, the, the protests that came as an outgrowth of that. I guess I've, I've been talking a lot here. I, I'm, other people, I, I uh, have any questions or want to jump in? Is 
is, this is Barbara. I always have a question. <laughs> but uh, mm -hmm. uh, when you talk about the carbon pricing and that it's not at the point of purchasing gas at the pump, who is being priced for their greenhouse gas emissions? I'm going to try to answer that or? T Tammy? No, you can go ahead, Burn. No, you can go ahead, Burn. So um, carbon pricing works like this: you don't, you don't, you don't tax the gas as it's being pumped out of the pump. What you do is you tax the the, the bulk quantities of oil or gas as they come into the state. Let's say, so when they cross the state line, the truck gets a fee fee on it, a carbon fee, and that trickles down, uh, and it shows up as an increased price at the pump eventually. But it's not a, a real tax in the sense that um, you or I am not paying a tax of 25 cents or whatever as we pump out our gas at the pump. That answer your question? Well, I guess I can see why people call it a tax <laughs> when you increase the price at the pump. But uh, when you said that it's coming in with the delivery of fuel, what about those who are creating uh, the, the fuel before it gets into the truck and all of that. Are they taxed or, or it's just that delivery that comes into the state? Is that it? Well, um, we're talking about a state bill here. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. The other, other states are not, not, don't have this tax. If the whole country had it, okay. I guess we'd have it uh, mm -hmm. on a countrywide basis instead of a statewide basis. And so the, the end result is that this, additional amount of money that's going to be available is going to go to lower income people or other projects how does how is that going to be parlayed to others well there's different there's different versions of of what what happens to the money one is that as tammy said we could put it into something like housing um and um we use less oil and gas to heat houses, say in the future, because of the investments we made. And that would result in, you know, our importing less oil and gas into the state in the future. So it would help to reduce the amount of uh, fees we have to charge. Uh, another, another version is that um, you can give it all back to the people who use, use the gasoline, let's say, um, we had a, we, we charged gasoline, a, a fee on gasoline, and the price went up at the pump. We took all that fee and gave it all back to the people who bought gasoline. Uh, you might say, well, what, is that, what does that accomplish? What it accomplishes is that if we gave the same amount back to everyone who buys gas in the state, then the people that buy a lot of gas will end up paying more. The people that buy a little amount of gas will pay less. It, 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 it's, sort of, it's sort of something that doesn't sound obvious when you first think about it, but when you think about it a little bit, it, it starts to make sense. That means that the refunds would not be in proportion to the amount of gas that they bought. I'm sorry, what was that, Dale? Yeah, uh, from your description, I got the feeling that the refunds uh, of this money would not be in proportion to the amount of gasoline that had been purchased. Um, you know, that's right. So you get charged a fee and say it trickles down and causes the gas to go up by 25 cents a gallon for everyone. But supposing you, supposing I buy 500 gallons of gas a year, you only buy 300 gallons of gas. I'll, I'll end up paying more fee than, than you would. And if we all get the same amount back as a check from the state, then you'd make out better and I'd make out worse. Yeah, understood. The other, the other question that comes to me is that, um, how do you handle things like uh, electricity uh, production? Because if there's a tax on fuels coming into the state, won't that drive the people to purchase their electrical power from out of state? Uh, and then there's things like cement production, 
which is kind of a double whammy because uh, not only do you get the CO2 out of the uh, uh, materials that are being roasted, but you also have the CO2 that comes from the uh, fuel being used to heat it. Uh, and how does that all work? Uh, and does it even apply to that industry? Well, now, now you're asking questions that are, uh, that are too complex for me to answer, so. Yeah, uh, same for me. I do know that we've talked a lot about the electric grid needing upgrades and then making greater investments in solar. Um, and I think that's where you would see some of the impact on what you're talking about. But I'm definitely not an energy uh, technocrat or anything like that. I don't, I don't know the mechanics of, of all of that. Um, I think one of the other things that comes up is especially, and it came up for us as it relates to transportation, um, specifically uh, in the transportation bond bill and revenue bill is trying to come up with a package that reduces um, congestion um, and road use, which is, you know, very pricey and trying to make uh, public transportation the easier, um, easier choice. And I know it's complicated given COVID and the need for physical distancing, but once we get back to a little bit more business as usual, what are the opportunities there? Because if you're doing, to, to the point that you were, were describing, Burn. so if you have um, a Tesla or a hybrid, you're using less gas, but you're still using the road and you're still contributing to, to congestion for people who can't afford those cars because they can't, you know, afford um, uh, to go and purchase a new car um, or don't have capacity to, plug a car in. I live in a condo complex. There are tons of people in our state who <laughs> live in uh, multi-unit dwellings who don't have access to a place where they could even plug in a car. So there are some other uh, equity considerations as we talk about the different ways to think about carbon pricing or a gas tax or any of, any of those um, pieces of it. So I'd also add that an electric car still has a lot of CO2 attached to it because the generation of the electricity produces a lot of CO2 in most cases in this country. Unless you're getting it from solar, uh, it may actually exceed yep. that gasoline powered car. Um, I know that Tammy's got another meeting. She's got to get on it too. So Tammy, do you have any last words for us? And, and then we can continue discussing once Tammy leaves. Well, there's one other thing, and it's so difficult to keep track of all of this, but um, there are all of these little things that also make a difference when it comes to the climate. And I just want to highlight one thing that happened when we were taking up the transportation revenue package um, is that one of the things, for whatever reason, that Ways and Means decided to do um, on the House side is to eliminate the tax on rolling stock. And why this is important is that um, rolling stock, which are like your five axle rigs and the and the larger the larger vehicles, they're you know eighty thousand pounds. They cause damage on our highways of equivalent to five to ten thousand um, equivalent to cars. And so now we've eliminated that tax. So that means you know, truckers who are going from Maine to South Carolina as they go through the state are not paying any sort of tax, but they're still using our roads and impacting our roads, which then goes back and impacts municipal budgets, uh, all of the investments in, in roadways, um, and it does obviously tie to, to climate. So there are all these little things to be paying attention to. Um, I filed an amendment on it. It did not pass. I did roll call it so you can see how the other reps voted um, on that particular amendment, but it's important because it means that the state's losing nine to $10 million a year if this does get passed on the Senate side. Um, but it also is still a signal that like, well, we're gonna still accept business as usual with these big large trucks. And it's fine that they're kind of in the, in the spirit of commerce um, to make Massachusetts more competitive, we're gonna give this away. Um, and so that's part of this, this story that complicates things is how we as a state think about what our competitive advantage is um, and part of the arguments that people give are, well, it, you know, it's impacting jobs, but only 2% of truckers are in unions. Only 2% of truckers would actually benefit from any sort of trickle-down effect. So we still hear over and over again in the House, on the Democratic side, this notion that we have limited resources and they need to be divided up in a certain way and trickle-down works. And 
that ties into the impacts that we are able to make on certain issues like climate change, transportation, healthcare, housing, education, all the things that I think, you know, intersect here. So I, that, that's, those are my closing remarks on that. Well, thank you for pulling us together. I really appreciate all these efforts. It's great to be with two other Mount Holyoke alums. Love it. Melissa, what year did you graduate? 2008. Nice. Awesome. I'm 96. I'm like way older, but it's awesome. Good. All right. Well, thank you very anything much. Anything else, Rebecca or Tom? Thanks very much for coming. Yeah, thank Absolutely. You. Thank you. And thanks for thank you for your questions. Yeah, thank you for your questions. Thank you for uh, your work. And let me know where else I can be helpful. And if you want to follow up on anything with me after you uh, meet with other folks, I'm more than happy to do that. Great. Again. All right. Take care, everybody. Bye. Thanks.